Ladies and gentlemen, I am super excited to welcome today's guest to the show, but first, please hit subscribe in the bottom right of this video on YouTube and hit that thumbs up and give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram at livinthedream506 or if video isn't your thing, find us on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. Thanks for all the support. It really means a lot to me. Sincerely, I can't believe the artists I get to talk to on this show and that doesn't happen without you guys. So thank you so much. Seriously. My guest today plays keyboard in one of my all-time favorite bands, My Morning Jacket. He's also toured with Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, which we talk about a bit, which is insane. It was an honor and an absolute pleasure chatting with him, and I hope you enjoy it too. So please give it up for Bo Coster. So, Bo Coster of My Morning Jacket. How you doing, man? Doing well. Good, good, good. How you keeping busy? Man, it's a struggle. Is it? It just depends on the day, you know. Um, I've had some, you know, recording and music work, you know, but that's not consistent. <clears throat> so, I've been working on my own stuff, which, you know, it's easy for a while, but then, you know, every day feels like Groundhog Day. <laughs> I think part of being like an artist and like <clears throat> a musician is being able to bounce off the world, you know, and get inspired or go out and see shows or, or like talk to your friends about music or whatever. But when you're just like by yourself all the time, it's just not, not quite the same. But uh, yeah, man, a lot, of, a lot of long walks with my dog and Netflix. <laughs> the usual. Yeah, yeah, totally. So you said working on your own stuff. So is that just solo project stuff? Like I know you don't yeah. really release too much on your own, but is that yeah, something new? Yeah, just like solo piano stuff and just practicing and writing. I, I have a bunch of tunes that I need to record at some point, but uh, I haven't done it yet. So I'm kind of still working on that. Now, yeah. does that project have a name or is it just basically um, Bo Coster? Yeah, no, it doesn't have a name yet. I, for a while, like about a year ago, before I went on tour with Roger Waters, I, I was playing out like once a week with these guys in LA. And it's more of kind of like an improvisational instrumental thing, um, kind of like jazz groove. Uh, it's hard to describe, but it, yeah, it's more in that, in that world, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, some of that stuff, that you're doing on your on your own do you bring that to my morning jacket or do you try to keep that completely separate yeah i mean my morning jacket is is you know top down from jim it's not necessarily like a democratic creative process it's it's it starts with jim songs <clears throat> and he, <laughs> and he's the uh hey sh sh no and he's the uh he's kind of the creative director of the ship so we kind of help him you know what i mean and uh so yeah like every now and again you know we'll we'll have some ideas that end up in the song or whatever but uh for the most part it's his stuff hey yeah so you mentioned right off the bat the roger waters stuff and i had a ton of questions about that um yeah so i'll, I'll jump right into that just to stay on sure. the on the theme um for, I'll just I'll bunch it all into one, and then maybe I'll let you speak on it. Okay. Uh, Sh Sean Etchison said, would love to know the types of things you experienced and learned touring with Roger Waters. Brian Cohn said, the synth in Feel You reminds him of Rick White in Welcome to the Machine, and mm -hmm. does he influence your sound at all? And Neil Burke says, go Bobcats. 
how has his experiences with Roger Waters influenced his on stage with My Morning Jacket? So if you could just like speak a little on the whole Roger Waters yeah. experience, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to even know how that affected me um, and how that experience changed me or whatever. But, uh, you know, working with somebody like Roger is like, it's like playing, uh, it's like playing with Le LeBron James or something, you know what I mean? Where it's just like, he's such a monster um, artist because he has such he has such a command of every aspect of the art, um, you know, visually, um, as a lyricist, as like a conductor. Um, he's just like, he's such a, just a monster human being. And uh, being around him is just inspiring in general. It made me, <clears throat> it made me realize what great art, what, what it takes to make great art, you know what I mean? It's not just having a great voice and good and, and being good with melody, or it's not just being good with lyrics, or it's not just having a good sense of like art direction. It's all of it. You know, if you really want to be, you know, if you really want to make art that, that transcends and, 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 and affects everybody, that's what, that's what you got to do. You got to like hit it from all sides. And he's, he's, he's one of the few that's been able to pull it off, you know, um, and he's still doing it. And he's still, <clears throat> he still lives on his edge. He's still like incredibly creative. He's still really inspired, still really motivated. It's a pretty inspiring guy to be around really. <clears throat> was and then the Richie contagious on stage with him. Oh yeah, totally. Being around him, you just feel like, you feel like uh, fearless. He's a, he's just a really strong, fearless leader, and he's good. He's good at making everybody feel like we're, you know, like you're going into battle and you, and you're gonna win. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. He has he has an incredible vibe and energy about him. Uh, yeah, and then the the Rick Wright thing. It's funny because you know Pink Floyd was basically my favorite band growing up, or at least, you know, top three, top five, whatever, you know, like they had a huge effect on me. And so like, <clears throat> I think that stuff comes out just naturally when I make music, you know, it's just part of your taste um, palette or whatever, but it wasn't like a specific attempt to sound like Rick or whatever. And it's funny because Pink Floyd uses this thing called a Arp Selena, which is like a synth string. Um, <clears throat> keyboard and uh i played that on the roger tour and we actually did welcome to machine on that tour and um the the synth that i used on feel you is different it but it's also like synth strings so it's just kind of from that era it just sounds like you know late 70s early 80s kind of like synth strings or whatever which is uh it's a cool effect to use yeah absolutely um and I suppose like playing with a legend like that and just like you said, you're just fearless in it, going into battle, knowing you're going to win. I get that vibe with my morning jacket as well. And it's just having that power and perfection around you. You can kind of get into like a flow state of playing music, whereas you're not worried about if somebody else is going to screw up or you're not worried about what's going to happen. You just know everything is going to happen the way it should. And it allows you to really focus on your craft and play exactly how you feel. And I get that vibe with you guys and like, yeah, totally. obviously in the studio, but especially live, it's just from start to finish. It's, it's so powerful, dynamic and just flawless. Yeah. The, uh, the, my morning jacket thing is, is it's funny. It's like, it's similar, but like on the opposite end of the spectrum in a lot of ways. Um, because when we play together, it's almost like a group. There's almost like a group improvisational aspect to everything that we do. And so we're always listening to one another. And if, if somebody wants to take a left turn, usually the four, the four guys are right there to do it. Whereas like with, with Pink Floyd, it's all very scripted. You know, it's all about hitting your marks exactly the way 
they were intended to be hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's uh, it was fun to kind of do something different, but I definitely missed, I missed the freedom and the creating on the spot of being with my morning jacket after a while, you know, <clears throat> cause you play these great songs, you know, these great, amazing Pink Floyd and Roger songs. And you play them the same way night after night after night. It's almost like being in a Broadway play or something. You know what I mean? Cause everything's tied to the visuals and the visuals are such a huge part of the show. There's not a whole lot of room to stretch out. You know what I mean? And I love that about my morning jacket that we're always trying to find new places and, and take the music somewhere else. Um, they're both valid, you know what I mean? And, and my morning jacket does that too, with, especially in the studio, you know, we're definitely more uh, into like crafting the song and treating it like architecture in the studio. And then when we, then when we get live, it's more about kind of improvis improvisation and, and taking it somewhere new. <clears throat> What percent would you say of the live show is actually improv? My Morning Jackets? Yeah. Um, that's hard to say. It probably only ends up being like 25% or 20%, you know what I mean? Where it's like maybe even less. But there's always the notion that any song can kind of change if if – if someone's feeling it, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of cool. So even when we play the same song that we've been playing for 15 years, there might be a section all of a sudden that opens up, you know, which is cool. And then we may never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so is that how like, like the, there's a breakdown in Wasted on the new album. Is yeah. that, is that, was that uh, recorded like live off the floor? Yeah, pretty much. It was like, I, it's hard to remember how we did it, but I think it was just like, okay, like, let's start it with a keyboard solo, and then we'll, then we'll let Carl take a solo, and then Jim will take a solo, and then we'll bring it back, but it'll be like halftime or this different groove, I forget what it was. Um, and we just kind of worked it out on the spot. Um, so that was fun. Yeah, it's fun to also to listen to the new album because people are, some people that I've talked to kind of didn't realize that it was recorded with the waterfall the number one. Right. So to go back and listen to the two together gives it a, a good perspective and a bit of a different feel really, because you see a five year span between albums, you expect maybe some evolution or some differing avenues, which there is because you guys wrote so much music for that one album. Yeah. Totally. It's cool to listen to them as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, I actually went back and listened to a few songs off the Waterfall One <clears throat> a couple days ago, and it was uh, it was cool. They kind of inform each other. I mean, it, one the one like now that Waterfall Two is out, it's like I I kind of am more proud of Waterfall One than I was before. And now you know what I mean. Yeah. And and listening to Waterfall One makes me kind of like appreciate Waterfall Two more too. You know, um, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> the fact that we waited five years in between, I think is kind of unique in this, in this day and age because everybody's like wants everything now and nobody has any patience for anything. And, um, and it's just a unique way to release a record. It's like, okay, let's, let's make something and, and stash it for five years and then put it out. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that unique way of experience something that's like kind of an artifact of, of, of the past, but it's actually now, I think gives it a special unique quality and especially with what's going on in the world today. Um, it, it's funny, you know, we didn't plan it that way, but it, it was almost like it was meant to be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and was that like, when did that become the intention? Were those songs just going to be, stored away in a vault and possibly never see the light of day. I mean, five years is a long time and it took yeah. a pandemic to get it. So, I mean, what was, what was going to happen with that? I mean, honestly, I don't really, I don't even know. I, I can't even like, I can't even say specifically 
what the plan was or, or how it got to where it was. But, it, you know, it's, it's more of just like the answer is like life just happened to us, you know, where like we put out the waterfall and then we were so focused on touring on the waterfall that we kind of forgot about waterfall too, or we didn't have, we didn't quite have like a, a plan for it. I think we, we weren't quite sure what it was going to be. We hadn't gotten around to finishing it either, you know. I mean, it was mostly finished, but we still need to mix it and sequence it and stuff like that and decide which songs are going to be on the record. So it was just kind of like this unfinished thing that was sitting in the corner, and then we kind of got distracted and started doing all these other things. And then um, we kind of hit a wall after touring on the waterfall. We toured pretty hard on it. <clears throat> And then, you know, just like life stuff and personal stuff got, you know, started happening to various members of the band. And um, and then I think, you know, we kind of decided we wanted to take a break, just kind of like a bit of a hiatus. Then so Jim started doing some solo stuff and then I got the gig with Roger and then Carl put out a record. <clears throat> um, you know, so it wasn't really, it wasn't really intentional we just didn't really get around to it, you know? And we yeah. didn't, I guess we just didn't feel the momentum too to like, just like put out another record right away. I think like a lot of people don't understand like the process of making a record, mixing it, leading up to putting it out, all the decision-making and all the, all the heart and soul that gets put into it. And then you tour and touring can be can be draining man it can be a grind just like psychically you know you, it drains your energy especially like i feel like for our band because we kind of give everything we have every night on stage and we play long shows and uh it's hard for us to just like clock in year after year you know like put out a record make a record tour on the record without like without really like paying the piper you know what i mean and so like the thought of like make a record put out a record make a record put out a record which we had been doing for a long time it's just not feasible it's not feasible like life style you know like for for five guys to get along perfectly make music perfectly have a full tank of energy psychically physically to not get hurt to not get sick you know like and I think the fans just like expect you to just like not run into run into walls and just like be this like perfectly operating machine all the time that doesn't need like some checkup and tune up now and again. It's just like it's just not it's just not feasible. You know what I mean? I always think of like what Robbie Robertson said about the band at, like in the last waltz. He was just like you know like I forget what the exact quote was. He's but but he was just like this touring lifestyle he's talking about the touring lifestyle is like it's an impossible way of life you know it's just really you can't kind of tour nonstop forever it will break you or it will break some of you you know and it only needs to break one of you you know what i mean for it to be like that okay that's it you know <clears throat> and even at one point i think levon before the band even became the band they were touring around like backing up people and he was just like i'm out man and he went to go work like on an oil rig or something. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's like, you know, that happens to a lot of bands, I think, that are together for a long time. You know, you kind of hit a wall. You just need to take a break. And that's kind of what happened with us. Yeah. And it was originally set to possibly be a double or even a triple record. Yeah. Does that mean there's more songs from that recording process? Or yeah. There's a couple more songs that didn't really fit on either record. Um, songs that we didn't really love, you know, that I don't know if we'll ever see the light of day. You know, sometimes it's just not all, it's not all worthy for a release. Um, sometimes like a song can just feel like, oh, it's, that's exactly like the song we've already done, or it sounds like an exercise. It's not really quite like, worth it like artistically to let out so i'm not sure sometimes they come out as b-sides i mean yeah. our band we, we release a lot we release most everything that we do so we don't really hold much back um so it, it might come out <clears throat> um but yeah the triple record thing i think was like 
if you if you listen to the two if you listen to the two records you can hear kind of like a funky psychedelic soul record in there and then you can hear kind of like a straight up kind of rock record and then you can hear more of like a stripped down folk um type of record um so that i think that's kind of what we were thinking you know like stylistically there could be three records there yeah yeah um just a step back when did you start music start playing music yeah when i was in first grade <laughs> started playing the piano and my mom uh my mom wouldn't let me take lessons in a long time and i begged her and finally she let me and uh that was it i was off to the races <laughs> right from there you knew that that was what you were going to do yeah it's funny man something like it just was at a calling and my my mom and dad never asked me to practice never asked me to go to lessons i always wanted to do it you know what i mean sometimes your your mind and whatever your soul just knows you know what i mean yeah Kids, yeah <clears throat> so you also did like production coordinator work in tv and stuff like that was that just a way to make money to yeah pursue music yeah i i moved to la originally to go to cal arts and and uh i ended up not going i couldn't afford it and couldn't figure it out and uh I just got a job, like a friend of a friend gave me a job at this production company. I just kind of worked my way up the ladder there for like five years or so while I was doing music on the side, basically. Did you have bands through that process? Yeah. Yeah, I played in a lot of like local stuff, you know, just like whatever, $100 gigs, or, you know, anything I could find. Um, I, at the time I joined My Morning Jacket, I had been doing a lot of like <clears throat> kind of like live hip hop and soul stuff in LA. There was kind of like a pretty big like live hip hop scene at the time where uh, MCs were playing with like live bands. And there was like this, there was this a uh, hundred piece like hip hop orchestra at the time. That was like a big deal. And um, <clears throat> so I was doing a lot of that stuff. I played in this band called a uh, hoodie Smith Um a couple of people in that band kind of went off to have like pretty decent careers. The lead singer, uh, Jametta Rose, she, she kind of had like a, she's put out a few awesome records and, and the bass player, Pete, he, uh, <clears throat> he's like this monster bass player. He played with like the Zappa play Zappa band and all these guys, you know? So, um, that was like a, that was a thing. I was doing a lot of jazz, a lot of jazz gigs. I was like, still studying, studying music on the side a lot of like singer songwriter stuff the hotel cafe just kind of like whatever you know what i mean yeah so did you go to berkeley straight out of high school i did yeah and then i left i was only there for like a semester oh really yeah so i'm like it's funny when you like read the brochures for berkeley school of music it'll be like this long list of famous musicians or whatever that went there and I swear, like, 90% of them dropped out, you know, after, like, a year. <laughs> Almost what? none of them finished. Why'd you drop out? Man, I just, like, I wasn't ready for it. You know what I mean? I was, it, I was too immature. I was just kind of, like, I didn't quite have... Yeah, I just didn't have, like, the emotional maturity or, like, the 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 ability to practice long hours. So I just kind of like, I felt intimidated and I was having trouble making friends. I like, I was just, it was weird. I was just like, home. I started getting anxiety, you know, where it's like my heart was pounding and I was just like, man, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And that. it was, it was also kind of dumb because like the curriculum is just like, it wasn't that inspiring. You, you get like one lesson a week and the lesson was a half hour long and so you go in and this dude you, you have no relationship with them and like by the time you say hi and talk you have like 20 minutes and this is like before YouTube you know and so it's just like I was like what am I doing here you know I could like teach myself half of this shit you know what I mean or I could find like a better teacher and just like study with them more seriously 
for longer hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was a, just a half hour lesson. And then basically it was you work on your own till next week. Yeah. Yeah. And there were like, you know, there were other classes and stuff, you know, like arranging and ear training and stuff like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Was, the, the school has a lot to offer, you know what I mean? But at the time I just was like, what, what the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> it just felt like a factory. You know what I mean? You go in the practice room and there's like 30 people in there and like everybody's like waiting to get in a practice room. And I just, it just felt weird. Yeah. So, so then you had, you had almost 10 years or more until you joined my morning jacket in 2004. Yeah. So after that, I went to Ohio university. That's why the, the guy in the chat or whoever that was. was right. Saying good podcast. Yeah, and that was kind of where I really, like, kind of started to cut my teeth musically. I played in a lot of different bands there. And I would just go to the music school there and just, like, sneak in practice rooms. And, and like, just, like, I was just kind of, like, self-teaching. You know what I mean? And that's why I ended up trying to go to Cal Arts because uh, I had been kind of working on everything at, at OU, and I wanted to, like, I wasn't going to give up on music school. And there's this guy, Charlie Hayden. He was a famous jazz bass player. He played with like Ornette Coleman. He's like one of the most famous <clears throat> bass players of all time. And he was heading up that that school there at Cal Arts. And it was like it was the kind of thing where you could you could create your own cur curricul curriculum. Yep. And um, and so he and I had talked about like kind of like designing my own lesson plan because so, I had a, like a wide variety of interests. In music you know I grew up playing classical music I went to Cleveland Institute of Music so I was like a classical conservatory and then I've like studied with like some pretty heavy like jazz piano players around that time and I, then I pl I'd been playing in rock bands my whole life you know growing up in Cleveland and and shit like that and just playing in like blues bar bands and shit you know so like for me I kind of needed to like I needed to be able to to have the freedom to, to study and, and follow my, my whim, you know what I mean? So I was gonna go there and then I just never, never could make it happen. <laughs> right. And then, so 2004, you and Carl Bramel joined My Morning Jacket. How does, how does that happen? And like, were you familiar with the band before you joined? Were you a fan or anything? Yeah, um, yeah, Carl and I have similar stories. We were both living in LA kind of just trying to make it as, you know, trying to make a living being a musician, doing various things. And uh, we had both heard the band on, on the local radio station here, KCRW, um, which still plays the band. Um, and uh, so that was kind of like my connection. And, and the guy that works with the band, this guy, Jamie Serretta, he's, he's been involved with the band song publishing <clears throat> from the very beginning. And he kind of like, he kind of like discovered the band in a way. I mean, I think he was one of the first people that the band worked with on the publishing side, even before we had our first manager, I think. And so like he had a hand in discovering the band and he was a friend of mine, just like, you know, he was a guy like, I hung out with, you know, he was a part of a friend group, honestly. And like, we had never really connected on a musical level other than just like listening and talking about music. But like, I knew he worked for like a record label or song publishing and he had a lot of connections, but it, like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't the kind of guy who'd be like, Hey man, like get me a gig or, you know, like introduce me to some people, you know, and a lot of people who moved to LA are like that, you know, cause they come here to like make it or whatever, you know? And so there's a lot of like, attempts to like climb the social ladder out here and I, I was always kind of turned off by that so I was kind of like and it probably hurt me more than it helped me but Jamie was actually just a friend and out of the blue one day he called me he's like dude I think I found the perfect thing for you and he left it on my answering machine that's how long it was ago like and he was like it's this band called My Morning Jack and I was like no way I just heard one of their songs on the radio and I loved it you know, I think it was a I will sing songs off of off of it still moves, and uh, and then he was like, they're they're had they're like auditioning keyboard players and guitar players next week or whatever, and you should 
you should do it. And that was it. Like I talked to Jim on the phone for like five or 10 minutes and like just to kind of feel each other out. And so like that went well. And so then I auditioned and that went well. And I think like two or three weeks later, I was on the road and both Carl and I were on the road. Like, you know, I think we, we had like a five or six week tour with Dr. Dog was opening up for us. And then we went to England and played this, this big show. Was it this big enemy show, the Astoria? It was pretty epic, man. What's it like to step into something like that, to go from basically nothing music-wise, like playing live, to such a big crowd and so much? I mean, Man, I was, yeah, I was just stoked in every way because, like, you know, it's like every kid's dream to, to, to live out that, like, rock and roll dream of, like, being in a rock band and going on tour, you know? It's just like, it just seems like the greatest thing you could be doing in your life at the time, you know? And the, and the thing about it was, is I like, I really love the music and I really like connected to, to Jim's songwriting and his voice and his, this, this like, there's like a, there's a through line with all five of us. I think that like is why we, we have such good chemistry and it's like, it's an emotional thing, you know, like we all kind of like vibe on that level. And uh, so, like, when we all met, it's just, like, we all just got along really well. Like, all five guys are just, like, really sweet, good people, you know? We have, like, similar kind of sense of humors. And so it's just, like, it's almost like when you meet, when you meet, like, the love of your life or one of the loves of your life, you meet, like, a girl and you're just, like, you're just, like, so excited that you met this person and you're dating them. It's, like, that, that new feeling. That's what it was like. You know, it's like, oh, man, I can't fucking believe I found these guys and I'm like playing this music. It's insane. <clears throat> so yeah, man. And then, and then, and that's in a lot of ways, it's like how I still feel today. You know, you know, we're, we're more seasoned and we're more jaded and we've, we've, we've done so many things and um, it's easy to get, it's easy to like take it for granted, but you know, I still feel that way, you know? Yeah. Like when, I, when, <laughs> when we just put out the record, I was, you know, I tuned into the listening party or whatever, and I, and I still had that feeling. I was still excited, you know. I was excited that, like, we were putting out this record, you know, and I was excited that, that we had done that work, and, and I, I have a lot of excitement to go on the road and play these songs for people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you mentioned just, like, jumping into it and just it was your dream and everything like that. And earlier in your career, you, you said that uh, – one of your one of your dreams was to play Red Rocks, and Michael River was wondering. Now that you've achieved that goal, like, what goals do you have for the future? And and what was that experience like? Also, like finally playing Red Rocks. Yeah, I mean, we've done it so many times now. Actually, like, I have like a they give us like this little like trophy, and it's like a piece of the rock, and it has like the year and the dates, and I have like one. I have six of them now, you know what I mean? It's like, we've played there like six times and, and some of them were like two nights. And it's funny, it, it always feels exciting. You know, it always almost like feels like the first time when you play there, there's something magical about it. And maybe it was just like growing up and watching that YouTube video, you know, like Sunday, Bloody Sunday. I think was that the song. And um, yeah, it's just one of these like hollow grounds, you know, it's like playing Madison Square Garden or, or, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe the other ones. Well, there's the Gorge. Have you guys ever played the Gorge? Gorge? Yeah, we played uh, the festival there once. That's pretty epic. I remember waking up in the, in the bus, in the tour bus, and there was a window. There was a window in my bunk in the tour bus, and I remember opening the window, and it was literally just the Gorge. And I was like, that's pretty wild. But, yeah, I mean, it's a funny thing, you know, I'm in my forties now and I've been doing it for a long time. And, and after the Roger gig, I mean, the Roger gig, you know, if you would have told my, we always talk about this, like our 12 year old selves or our, our 11 year old selves, if you would have told us that this is what we would be doing, like our 12 year old selves would be freaking out, you know? And like, 
when I was in seventh grade, I literally listened to like The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon and Metal and Animals and like all these records, literally only like exclusively, you know? And I was like an angry fucked up kid. Like I was like, I got in tons of trouble. I got kicked out of school. And like Roger's like rebelliousness and his like understanding of like the human the human predicament really spoke to me at the time. And uh, so like, if you would have told me that like I could be playing that music with that guy, you know, it's fucking insane. It's like you, you, you literally live out your 12 year old self's dreams. And once you do that, it's like, it's almost like climbing a mountain, like you climb Mount Everest and, and then you're like, now what, you know, now what do I do? There's a bit of that that happens. And the other thing you realize is that those things don't make you happy. You know what I mean? Like what really makes you happy is like the meaning that you bring to the struggle of getting there. You know, when you have a goal, the day-to-day attempts to achieve that goal are the most like juicy, fruitful times. So in some ways I look back at like, the early days in the band where we were trying to, to, to kind of like jump up the next rung or whatever in our careers or like the few years right before I joined my morning jacket when I was really struggling and, and I like chasing my dreams. Those are some of the best times of my life, you know? <clears throat> and now that, now that I've done all that stuff, it, it can be a little, you you can feel like like a ship without a rudder a little sometimes, you know what I mean? Cause you're like, it's, it's what defined you for so long. Your pursuit of this dream, your pursuit of your, um, your craft. And then once you kind of achieve it, there's a moment of like, okay, I did it. Now what, you know? <clears throat> yeah. So what would be the message or the, the goal that you strive for now? It would be more about it, it's just like not 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 a, not focusing on the end result as much, you know, not focusing on the minor achievements or whatever, and more just enjoying whatever it is I get to do day to day, you know, and just appreciating that, you know what I mean? So it's like this record coming out, I don't really fucking care if it, if the reviews are good or not. It's just nice to be able to put a record out, you know what I mean? And to be a part of a thing. And so I really just enjoy, I jo- I'm enjoying the fact that I'm in a band that, that is creating stuff and putting it out in the world. And other than that, I'm like not really focusing on the results. You know what I mean? I'm trying to stick in that headspace and like, just kind of like, like if I sit down at the piano, just enjoy practicing or enjoy like the act of playing music versus like practicing for a specific goal or like thinking about what it's gonna do for me. You know what I mean? Cause I think a lot of like, especially rock musicians, you know, it's like we get in we get into the into the rock and roll game and we have ulterior motives. It's like we want to be cool, we want to we want to like get girls, we want to get rich, we want to get famous. And all that shit it's hollow. It doesn't make you happy, you know? And once you realize that, you realize like what really makes you happy is just the music and the 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 uh the pursuit of that goal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Before this interview, I spoke briefly with Joel Cummins, uh, the keyboard player for Humphreys McGee. Yep. And just to get his input for a question for you, because I'm a big fan of both bands. And he mentioned that he met you one day, one time on stage at Bonnaroo. Oh yeah. And he said to tell you that the new album is a really cool ride and it goes in a few directions that he didn't expect, which he, he really enjoyed. That's cool. And, He'd be curious to know how you choose your keyboards and tones for various songs and what goes into those decisions. Um, now for me, if I can just ramble for a, a yeah. second, um, it's really, to me, it's a testament to how perfect you are at like 
tone painting with your parts in the music like really sets the scene setting the scene for each song like magic bullet for example really stood out to me you really create a scene and a mood that like brings that song together so perfectly and it's just the right amount of tension and suspense and darkness and i found out after the fact of hearing magic bullet that song is actually about a mass shooting so it is a very serious subject and it is very yeah. suspenseful and dark in its in its tone and emotion and your parts are just perfect for it and there's a i mean a couple other songs i, I know i'm rambling but still thinking the keys create like a feeling of floating in thought to me and just really reflect the lyrics in that song of like hoping and dreaming and uh cl climbing the ladder i believe it's called sort of like a whimsical alt outlaw country vibe to it and just i guess to bookend his question like how do you choose between the keyboard tones and like what goes into those decisions yeah i mean it's like i don't even quite know a lot of it's just kind of like going with your gut you know and just having a lot of tools or things around that you dig you know just like oh like i like this keyboard i like this one thing it does you know, and you just kind of like stash that in your brain. And then when you're working on a song, you're like, oh, that, that could be a cool sound for this song. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that thing. And you just kind of throw it against the wall. And, and usually, you know, right away, you can just feel it, you know, and also like it helps having people in your band that have good taste. I mean, I definitely, you know, because it's like, these are Jim's songs and Jim's kind of like, the captain of the ship often it's like i may like a sound a sound but jim might not you know so i'm also i'm also kind of like thinking okay like how can i make everybody in the band stoked too you know what i mean so it's that collective like taste palette that we have you know <clears throat> that that kind of like goes along with it it's almost like when you have a group of friends and you all have like your way of speaking and you're like slang words and stuff like that like that's almost kind of how it is you know you sit around and fuck around with sounds and and talk about things that you like and you kind of like over time kind of develop your your taste palette you know what i mean and I think like on every record and Jim and I always talk about this, like we always try to find new sounds and new toys for every record, you know, and things that turn us on. So like when we get into the studio, we're not just relying on our old tricks, you know, and I've like, it's rare that like, I don't know, I don't know how many times I've repeated myself, but I, I don't, I think it's pretty rare, you know, like most records have new, new sounds. Um, and, uh, you know, there's obviously some tricks that I've, I've used a couple times, but I try to keep finding new approaches, you know? Um, That's one thing that a lot of people talked about with the new album is just how, especially putting the two together, both waterfalls, is that it seems like you really did step out on your own for those two albums and really, really accented the songs more so than in the past that like you really had a coming out party for these two waterfall albums. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why, because, you know, in our band, it's always been pretty guitar forward. Um, and there's such power to, like, Jim's guitar playing and Carl's guitar playing. They're, they have huge guitar tones, and the band is really about guitar solos and big drums, you know. And, and so for me, I've kind of been a supporting character. I've always just tried to play that that supporting role to be kind of a glue. Um, I think when we, ended, when we went in to make this record, we kind of had this like philosophy or both records, we philosophy of, uh, you know, no stone unturned. Like let's, let's, let's try to just be open to everything and see every song and every idea through. So I think we were a little bit more open minded than, than in the past where it was just like all right let's try it you know and I, I think that that was that resulted in good results for the most part i think it sometimes it was frustrated frustrating for for some people at times because it you know we might have labored over things or tried too many ideas and gotten kind of fatigued by it all but i think like the work paid off you know
Yeah. But yeah, it's just all like taste, you know, it all comes down to taste. You can't really teach taste. And I think like good taste just comes from like being obsessed with good music and just like absorbing as much of it as you can throughout your life. You know what I mean? So like when I go into the studio, the sounds and stuff that I pick are just like an amalgamation of all the music that I've loved and all the things that have like turned me on and, you know, and uh, I always tell like young musicians like that, they're like, they're like the last for advice. And I'll be like, man, work on your taste. And, you know, and, and coming up with an original sound. Cause I feel like so many people they'll go on YouTube now and they just try to become like these technically great musicians, which is also valuable, um, you know, because you, the more technique you have, the more you can do. And the more, you, you know, the more you can do, you know, it's so you can play whatever you hear in your ear, you know, you never want to be limited in that sense, but like taste and original sound is where it's at. You know what I mean? For me. Um, and I think all our heroes are that way, you know? Yeah, That's absolutely. <clears throat> but yeah, yeah just, just being like a melting pot of all your influences and then try to birth your own, your own styles and taste out of it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And yeah, and, and try not to try not to copy what other people do. Be inspired by what they do, but don't don't plagiarize. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people they like they'll look at the way somebody dresses or the way somebody writes a song and be like, oh, I want I want to do that, you know. And so they'll dress just like them and write songs just like them. And that's like it's I think it's a cool exercise, but you don't want that to be your thing. You want that to be like part of learning what your thing is you know what I mean? yeah absolutely um i had so many questions sent in so i'm going to do a little bit of rapid fire to try to get to as many as we can before i let you go here sounds great um so first and foremost my son michael asked what's your favorite jacket song to play and he also wanted you to know that his favorite songs are highly suspicious and victory dance great choices <laughs> how old is he nine sick um, my favorite songs to play. God, I like so many of them. I've always loved Wordless Chorus. Um, there's just something about like when the lights go out and like, cause I get to kind of sit back in that song and just watch. Cause I'm just kind of playing this simple kind of rhythmic, rhythmic parts, very like just triads, you know, I don't have to think too much. I've just got to make sure I try the, the vocal samples at the right time. And yeah. uh, so I can just kind of like sit back and watch the crowd and watch Jim sing. Um, so I was like, I always look forward to that moment cause I can just kind of like, take it all in that's like my moment in the show where i just kind of look at the crowd and watch it all go down yeah um, is there a sentimental value to that song where it's like the first album you did with my morning jacket that was the first yeah, song on the album definitely right yeah I'm, i was so proud of that record you know what i mean because it was like really the first major record i had ever played on and i like i remember just feeling like we had hit a home run you know, I was just like so stoked on it, you know, you did. So that, that will always like, that will always like have a place in my heart or whatever. But yeah, I like, uh, I like victory dance. I love playing that one. Securo. Um, God, I mean, yeah, there's so many. I like some of the, the It Still Moves tracks a lot. Like, I love I Will Sing You Songs. I love playing that one. Uh, Steam Engine. Uh, Easy Morning Rebel. I love that breakdown. Um, yeah, a lot of them. Nice. Like some of the old ones, too. Like, Old September Blues, I love to play. Um, Nashville, Kentucky. I like playing Carl's song, uh, Carried Away. I get, a, get to kind of stretch out and play the piano on that one. Yeah, that's a great track. 
Yeah, I like Jim's solo track to the uh, A E I O U. I love that yeah. tune too. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. I guess some of those are kind of more fun keyboard wise. That's maybe why I like them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this next one, I really like this question from Bernie Holland because I was also at this show. She says, I saw them play Bangor and Patrick got shellfish poisoning. Oh, so they man. played the entire set without him, which was That's insane. So fucked. <laughs> so we, we were both, everybody's wondering, like all my friends wondering like what this show was like for you guys. And like, have you ever dealt with anything else that crazy on the road? Like, what was that night for you? Just walk us through. Dude, that was okay. I have two stories. That was the second time that happened in Maine. The for first Patrick? time it happened. No, the first time was with Tom. Tom ate some shellfish, had a, like, couldn't breathe throat closed up, went to the emergency room, and we played the show without Tom, which is not playing a show without a bass player is like the worst. Because <laughs> it's just like, I was like trying to fill in with my left hand on like the roads and stuff. It was just so lame. And uh, he ended up coming out, coming back for the encore. And he came out and played One Big Holiday, like in his scrubs, in his <laughs> scrubs. It was pretty funny crazy yeah and then the other time um we can thank uh Humphreys McGee for this one actually because we were at High Sierra Fest and I'm totally outing him right now snitches get stitches <laughs> but um, so like apparently they had played a show in this in this hall like we were doing like a midnight show or something or we were playing like mid 3 a.m or something and there was like a bowl of candies on, a, on the table. And they were like, you know, those like colored foil candies where you don't really know what it is until you open it up. And right. uh, Patrick went backstage when we, when we got there for sound check. We, we had sound check at like noon during the day. We weren't gonna play until later that night. And Patrick ate one of them. And apparently it was like, they were, they were like laced with mushrooms or acid or something. And uh, we found out it was, it was like they were Umphreys McGee's later. And uh, so Patrick went back to the hotel and was like tripping all day long, you know, and then like we ended up playing that show that night. So that was pretty fun. Was he like a little straight by the time it was showtime? No. I think he ate a couple of them. <laughs> he ate a couple of them. He said it was like the wildest ride he's ever had. He said he got in the zone though for a minute. He was like, dude, I was like, I was so in the zone for like five songs. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, you'd have to ask them. I mean, I don't know if they, uh, if they remember if they're even guilty. Like I may be, we may, we may not have known for sure, but I think they copped to it. I'm pretty sure they copped to it and apologized. Like, so sorry, man, we forgot that we left him there or whatever, you know. <clears throat> That's odd. So something like this has happened twice to Patrick? No, first time was Tom. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, yeah. Once it was shellfish and the other time it was psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only times anybody's ever missed a show. I yeah, think. that's crazy. Yeah, we've never had a show. I don't think we've ever canceled a show, like, last minute. We've always show always went on you know well that bangor show was it was a really cool experience because i'd seen you guys multiple times before that so to see it kind of be broken down into an acoustic type show was almost a treat really oh that's cool yeah i remember we were bummed because we were headlining the festival and it was such like not the right way to headline a festival and i, I remember people left i remember it was like it was crowded and then it ended up being like half full by the end. I was like, yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah. It, it was a rough, it was a rough vibe that way. But like, I think for the, for the diehards, it was, a, it was a really, really great experience. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Um, Matt Abernathy and Frank J. Jeffries and a ton of other people are asking about the new album already. And like you alluded to earlier, people are impatient and yeah yeah give it to us you got more give it to us a new album came out last week give us the next new one um 
Yeah. Everyone just wants to know when's the new album coming? What's it called? Um, one thing I will uh-huh. say is I think I read a few people or a few accounts that said it's meant to kind of be released and then be played live immediately after. So it, to me, I think it, that means maybe waiting until shows come back to release that album. Yeah, it's like a dumb career move to, to, to put it out and then not tour on it at this point. It's funny because we were, we were, we were ready to, to, to get back at it this year. You know, we had been in the studio. Um, we started last fall and then in the winter of this year working on a new record. So it was like, you know, we played those four shows and whatever it was, it was August of last year. And then we went into the studio that fall and then we kind of finished it up for the most part in January and March. And, uh, and then the pandemic hit, but we had kind of planned it out that we were going to not play any shows this year until the fall, because we kind of felt like, um, it would be better to wait because Jim had just put out a record. Like Jim had been pretty active. He'd been putting out like so, a lot of solo stuff and we felt like it might be good to just wait until we could have like a full year to ourselves. And so we had planned to like tour in the fall and then release the record in the following year. So that plan is kind of still in place, but it's all pending on, you know, whether people feel safe going to shows. Right. And, uh, and whether we feel safe touring and whether we feel safe putting our crew at risk and our fans. And that's the other thing we feel, we, we feel responsible for our fans because like, like let's say somebody offered us a gig right now and they're like, we're going to like, take all the precautions it's going to be outside and we're going to make sure everyone's socially distanced and stuff. And, um, it's like, yeah, we could do that, but we, we would feel responsible for all these people traveling, you know, all these people potentially getting on planes, potentially putting themselves at risk just to see a show, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think we feel responsible to do the right thing and, and wait until it's safe, you know. Yeah. Obviously, that's that that goes without saying at this point. But even if it like, even if it gets to the point where it's like, oh, I think we're ready. I think we could do it. And you see some bands starting to play shows. Maybe there's like a vaccine that's like fifty percent effective, and maybe some people are taking it, and some people aren't. You know, like that's gonna be that that's gonna be the tough decision. Like, when is it really safe, and when do we really feel good about? putting out a record and touring again, you know? So it's just kind of until that moment happens, I think we'll probably wait, you know? But uh, yeah, the, the record's done for the Does most part. Name? We're, we're still trying to figure out the sequence and stuff like that. And uh, it's still much mixed and, and finished though. Does it have a name yet? No. Yeah. So we're kind of like right at the end there trying to figure out like, what it's going to be called, what the sequence of songs are going to be, what songs are going to be on the record and artwork and stuff like that. So, yeah, which is good. We have, we have, you know, we have some time to think about it. Yeah. I read that you guys recorded it, just the five of you in the studio. So how does that affect the music for better or for worse? Yeah, it was interesting. Usually there's like, you know, an engineer and a producer, or at least a producer and an engineer or somebody. And we just kind of like, just did it ourselves. We engineered it and produced it ourselves this time around. Um, and it was cool, you know, um, usually when the five of us are in a room together, we find the truth, but sometimes if there's another voice or another perspective in the room, it can kind of like, it kind of like we have cognitive sometimes, you know, but when it's just the five of us, there's a trust or something that we have that like we communicate really well together and we kind of just know what the truth is. And so it was nice to, to make a record that way, you know, cause it was like 
for better or worse, it, it was our record and, and, and outside perspectives weren't involved. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I'm not saying outside perspectives aren't really good because they are, you know, like in everybody we've worked with has been great, you know, from Lecky to Ciccarelli and Tucker Martin, of course, and Kevin Ratterman. Um, Kevin, Kevin actually uh, helped mix this record. So it wasn't completely just the five of us. We, uh, we uh, had him help us mix it. So, but Jim also kind of mixed it. So they kind of mixed it together. <clears throat> nice. But yeah, um, man, it was cool. So Tim Bills wants to know some of your heaviest influences, like musicians and bands of all time, and maybe a couple new bands that you've picked up in the last couple months that really stand out. What was the first part of the question? Like heaviest influences in your musical career. Um, man, that's such a hard question for me to answer because like I have – so many um, kind of signposts. Um, I have kind of like this side of me that really loves kind of like art rock, you know? So I love like Pink Floyd and, and Radiohead and, and early Genesis. I was a huge like P uh, Peter Gabriel era Genesis fan. If you listen to a lot of the keyboard work, that early stuff, you can hear a lot of my influences. Um, and then like, uh, you know, I have like this intense love for like soul music and jazz music and like, you know, stuff like Marvin Gaye and, um, and then like Miles Davis and, and Keith Jarrett, like stuff like that. So I get kind of like heady. And then I grew up playing classical music. So it's like, it's like Debussy and Ravel and stuff like that. I, I love, I still listen to that stuff on the regular. Um, and then I'm was like huge hip hop kid, you know, like I played in hip hop bands. I grew up like in the nineties when like that was huge. So it was like public enemy and all that stuff. Like, um, so I have a wide range of influences and obviously like classic rock, all the, all like the 60s, 70s shit, you know, Beatles, Dylan. I listen to Dylan like regularly. I listen to, the Who, The Who was like my favorite band when I was in fifth grade. It was like they were, The Who was like, The Who and The Kinks were my favorite bands before I discovered Pink Floyd and like some of the, the darker shit. Um, David Bowie, David Bowie's always been a huge, huge one for me. And then like, probably like if I had to pick one out of everything, it would be like Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder would be like my desert island artist. If I had if I had to listen to one thing for the rest of my life, it would probably be Stevie Wonder's catalog. <laughs> nice. So I don't know. It's, it's all over the place. Yeah, that's a. I mean, that's a pretty broad spectrum. So I think that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess he asked for new bands. Um, I haven't I haven't listened to as much new stuff recently, but um, I'm trying to think. But like all, you know, all the bands that, that people love, I'm into, you know, all the new band stuff, all the bands that we've toured with, like I still listen to new stuff all the time. Um, been listening to Big Thief recently. I really like them. Um, it's so funny when like, can't really like pull something out of the air, even though you know there's probably like 50 things you could say. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, last question. What waterfall is on the album cover of Waterfall 2? Oh, that, the, it's the same one, I think. I think it's like the same one from... Yosemite? No, it's a... Uh, God, I'm not sure where it is now. I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure. I heard some speculation of uh, from Waterfall. Like the first I heard that it was uh, somewhere in Yosemite but maybe somewhere in Oregon as well? Well, there's the one, the Multnomah Falls outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, it might be that one. God, it's so funny. I don't remember now. Such a, that's bad. Yeah. We can cut this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I sure. Mean, anyways, this was, 
this was a pleasure and an honor for me talking to you. It was so much fun. Uh, just, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Of course, man. It was my pleasure. And I, I can't wait till things open back up and I get to see you guys again. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. I feel, I feel like uh, we're going to get through all this. It was meant to be. For sure. Yeah. The new album, The Waterfall 2, available now. Anything else you want to say? That's it, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And see you soon, hopefully. All right, man. Take it easy. Cheers. Cheers.